Spinoffs have it really rough, man. It's hard enough having to convince someone to buy your stupid game based on its own merits, but if you make a title for an established franchise, especially if you deviate from the normal genre, you've now got an impressively small Venn diagram of people who are willing to give your game a chance. This was the fate in store for Platinum Games when they took up Kojima's offer to resurrect the cancelled Metal Gear Solid Rising project. Platinum took a long, hard look at Metal Gear Solid for reference and quickly got to work on the game. One problem though, they could only see out of their right eye following a work-related accident, and that eye has a brutal case of tunnel vision. So the game's direction shifted to a hack and slash similar to the company's previous works. And this was the reason I passed on this game for the longest time. I didn't have any interest in an action game taking place in the Metal Gear universe, I'd rather just play a real Metal Gear Solid game. It upset me to see this game of all things living it up in the Steam store instead of Snake Eater or Twin Snakes. I was convinced I wouldn't enjoy myself playing a Metal Gear game that doesn't play like a Metal Gear game. And thinking back, I can't believe I actually dodged this game because of that. It's almost embarrassing to admit how close-minded my stance towards it was. So, almost a full day played later, and here I am now to rectify my mistakes. Today I'm going to show you why you need to be playing this game right now. And make no mistake, this isn't a request, it's a threat. A threat to anyone who believes they won't have a good time here, and to those who believe they can't make a pass at this game without dating all five of her dads first. So what exactly makes this game worth playing? They are cyborg like you, eh? To panic incoming heat, throw out your own barrage of light attacks while your foe is on the offensive. Get off! Full stuff like this. The combat in this game is so fluid and intense. Attacks are relatively simple. All you need to know is X is your light attack and Y is your heavy attack, and pressing these two buttons in different combinations will result in new attacks. There is an extensive list of combos, but they aren't nearly as integral to your enjoyment of the game as they are with other hack and slashes. Games like Devil May Cry peak once you've mastered the art of kicking your opponent's ass by typing out a novel with the controller. But Metal Gear is more about dodging and parrying while getting in as many hits as you can. What makes it so invigorating is how much of a role momentum plays. All of Raiden's mechanics give the player the ability to control the pace of battle. Blade mode allows you to cut through most solid objects, including your foes. And aside from being the coolest thing you could ever add into a video game, its purpose is to keep you pushing forward at all times. Blade mode runs on a meter, so you can't just slow down time and slice everyone to pieces all you want. However, once enough damage has been done to an enemy, you're given the option to cut them straight down the middle and steal their fuel cells, which will automatically refill both your health and blade mode meter to full. It's a technique called Zendatsu, which literally means cut and take. By using it perfectly, you can theoretically never run out of blade mode, meaning you can never run out of your strongest offensive option. This sets up a pattern. Weaken an enemy, slice them up, press B, then boom keep going. Halfway through the game, you're gifted with Ripper Mode, which is only available when your meter is maxed. You gain the strength to tear through your enemies at will, and you can cancel it at any time, adding a new dimension to how you choose to approach fights because of how well it plays off of the Zendatsu mechanic. Your defensive tools directly contribute to your offensive push as well. Ninja Run closes the gap between you and your opponents quickly while also serving as your only reliable method of avoiding bullets. Raiden blocks with his sword, but if you block an attack against the exact moment it lands, you'll parry it, which typically leaves the attacker vulnerable to a swift blade mode kill. All of these tools work in tandem with each other to ensure that you can always dismantle your foes as efficiently as possible. The ball is in your court. React quickly, get creative, and give them hell. You're constantly building to that no damage S rank for every encounter, a perfect run. You beat it on normal? Good. S rank it. Done with that? Hard mode. Next, how about very hard? Then give Revengeance a try. It sounds like the kind of thing only diehard insane people who love the game more than they love their unborn child would do, but even without pledging obsession, I still found myself eager to tackle everything all over again. You keep learning new things the more you play. You learn more about enemy patterns, optimal routes, optional fights, all while sharpening your techniques and finding your own personal bread and butter combos. And when you get to see how 
much progress you've made. When you S-rank that boss you died to 12 times on your first run through, that's what keeps you going. The magic behind this game's combat is a genuine sense of improvement. And because of how fantastic those high moments feel, the juxtaposition of when you're getting annihilated hits like a cement truck. If I walked by your room and saw Sundowner at 15% with all of his shield left, I'd alert the authorities immediately on principle because you're just that fucking awful, but the point is, it's possible for this to happen. Your enemies will continually try to snap you out of your state of euphoric carnage, making every fight a constant tug of war to determine who controls the pace. And nowhere is this more apparent than when facing the bosses. Mistral Staff, Monsoon's Purple Untouchable Phase, Sundowner's Shield, Sam's Sword, Armstrong's Heal. All of these gimmicks are something the player has some form of control over. You don't need to send Sam into his judo phase or destroy the tiny robot so Mistral can't rebuild her primary weapon, but it's always a choice that you have even if it isn't explicitly told to you. This leads to each boss being an intense push-pull scenario where both parties are frantically trying to gain an advantage over the other. Fortunately for Raiden, he can walk into any mission as strong or weak as he wants to be thanks to customization. You earn credits throughout the game by doing basically anything, and you can use these credits in between missions to upgrade all kinds of things. Weapons, costumes, skills, wigs, meter extensions, health bar extensions. There's so much stuff here that it's impossible to unlock everything on your first playthrough, which is one of the greatest strengths of Metal Gear Rising. Whenever you finish a run, you can go back through and all of your upgrades will carry over. It's this in combination with the short length and addicting gameplay that makes Rising one of the most replayable games I've ever played. It's so replayable that when I accidentally deleted all of my progress from my first two runs through the game, I started it back up again the next day anyways and started from scratch. It's that fun. Coupled with the superb soundtrack that never fails to spike the adrenaline levels and you've got a really great game on your hands. But after the insanity that was the combat, maybe they mellowed out in other aspects of the game. No. No, dude, we're just getting started. The story of this game. It's insane. Every single character is insane. The people who wrote this script are not real humans. We follow Raiden from Metal Gear Solid 2 and 4, who makes his living nowadays as a cyborg security provider for a private military company. But when a rival PMC named Desperado starts causing turmoil with its gang of psychotic Power Rangers villains, Raiden springs into action to protect the lives they're threatening. Now if that last sentence sounded weird to you, it's probably because you picked up on the inconsistencies in tone. This story is completely tone deaf. The Metal Gear Solid game Games have plenty of wacky moments, it's kind of Kojima's thing, but in spite of this there's no shortage of tense moments with effective character drama. I think the two are balanced very well and these games wouldn't be the same without either. But then in comes Platinum Games, whose breakout hit Bayonetta starts with a 7 foot tall British witch gunning down angels in a cemetery as a J-pop remix of a Frank Sinatra song plays in the background. So needless to say, once you get them involved, any notion of restraint is quickly tossed out the window, and Kojima Productions, being Kojima Productions, just went along with it. Have a look at these scenes and try to piece together how they're all from the same game. Adios, amigos. I learned young that killing your enemies felt good. Really good. And something I can use to access the lab's main server? Perhaps. But first you need to take a dump. Wait, what? I don't care who thinks I'm right. And I've got cause enough for killing you. Your means end here. No, I passed one to you. It's almost like a parody of a traditional Metal Gear game, but you know what? I think they pulled it off beautifully. Yes, everything in this game is very, very stupid, but it's somehow so toothless that it's charming. We're talking about a development studio who wanted to subtitle their project with either Revenge or Vengeance out of spite for the original version of Rising which was cancelled, but they couldn't decide between the two and just went with both. By embracing its own off-the-wall nature, Metal Gear Rising turned out to be 
be some of the most fun I've had watching a game's story play out in a very long time. Every single character is memorable, and Raiden's encounters with them are a constant barrage of quotable one-liners. You've got this character who's every single little sister in a Square Enix RPG and it's the most amazingly out of place thing in the world. Raiden gets his own robot dog animal companion with a chainsaw tail. After murdering Sam in the desert and sheathing his sword out of respect as the sun sets on the horizon, we immediately cut to a guy eating pizza and looking at anime girls wearing maid outfits. And speaking of outfits, you can just buy the mariachi disguise from the cutscene and play the game while wearing it. Plus, everybody keeps talking about memes like they're the end-all be-all dictators of the general public's thoughts, and while there is some truth to that, that's also the funniest thing I've ever heard. This game will make you laugh, whether intentionally or unintentionally, and get you hyped up for every single combat sequence. So in my book, the story more than does its job for an action game, but what's even happening in the story? Well, Raiden is trying to stop a group of terrorists who are harvesting organs from children through human trafficking and training their brains to become merciless child soldier cyborgs. They then plan to murder the President of the United States in Pakistan to reinvigorate the war economy by creating what is essentially a second 9-11 level tragedy. Their child soldiers will then serve to make them a fortune by operating for PMCs during the ensuing second war on terror, and they'll use this newfound power to reshape America into a nation where the weak are cold and the strong thrive. What the hell? I feel like I need to wash my mouth out or something, like, oh, okay, I know I should have expected something like this, but am I even allowed to say what I just said? Jeez, man. And all of these actions are spearheaded by Stephen Armstrong, a Colorado senator and one of the top candidates for the position of greatest fictional character of all time. Chances are, if you know anything about Metal Gear Rising, you know who this is. His demeanor is one of the first things you'll notice about him. Everything that comes out of his mouth is entertaining. Making the mother of all omelets here, Jack. Can't fret over every egg. And this doesn't diminish his intimidation factor in the slightest. He's what every game villain should strive to be. Large, in charge, and full of contempt for American culture. His fight is incredible. His theme is the best song in the game, no, this is not up for debate, and he's the perfect finale to this wild ride of a video game. If it sounds like I'm being vague, that's because I am. You need to experience this for yourself. Just know that his inclusion alone makes this game worth playing, disregarding everything I've already said to convince you. So, in summary, this game has a lot going for it, even more so than I talked about in this video. It's currently still the latest Metal Gear game in the timeline since the franchise is effectively dead. There are tons of clever writing moments, like writing mimicking Sam's speech patterns the second he gets his sword. And there's two free DLC packs that let you play as Sam and Blade Wolf. Both of them are definitely worth it for the gameplay and added context to the events of the main game. But at the end of the day, this game is what every video game should should be. It's fun. Slicing through enemies, running around with a cyborg body, listening to Crispin Freeman talk in a southern accent, all of it is fun. And despite the astronomical standards that were set by the games before it, but certainly not after it, I think Rising is more than worthy of the Metal Gear name. So well done, Platinum Games. You're pretty good.